Hello, and welcome to Masters with Masters. I'm Ed Hoffman, and this is a joint ESA-NASA educational event, which brings together two master practitioners and leaders to share their experiences, stories, and reflections on their career in space. And we're extremely fortunate to have the leaders of the European Space Agency and NASA, Jean-Jacques Dourdan and Charlie Bolden, to join us today. And we really appreciate you taking the time out uh, over the next 50 minutes to share some of your thoughts and reflections with us. I also want to indicate that we're going to really want this to be an interactive event, and so we have uh, question uh, pads for you to write any questions you have. We have a lot of young professionals and uh, the student generation with us, so this is an opportunity to really ask questions of people who've had long, very successful careers in space. And so as you write down your questions, uh, just raise your hand and one of the uh, folks we have on the side will collect those and uh, uh, basically bring them up stage so that we can ask them uh, of our guests here. So again, I want to thank you both for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to talk with us. And I want to start with one of the themes that has come through from both of you loud and clear, which is the importance of international collaboration. And uh, I'll start with Mr. Dordan because one of the things I've heard you talk about repeatedly is the importance of international collaboration in space and also the fact that one of the things that ESA can teach the world is about collaboration since it's the basis for all the work and agreements that you do. Can you talk about what are some of the factors uh, that are necessary to be successful uh, when setting up an international collaboration and uh, working together on a mission? Yes, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, uh uh, uh, an organization where international cooperation is a daily uh, work. I must say that uh, it's uh, 18 uh, countries uh, putting their resources to, uh, to make uh, science and uh, to develop services to the citizens. And this is uh, uh, people from 19 nationalities working uh, together uh, on a daily basis. So uh, that is uh, uh, already ESA per se is uh, an international cooperation. But but more than that, ESA is cooperating with all space power, starting with NASA. Uh, as I said many times, uh, uh, ESA has been created in cooperation with NASA, the first scientific satellite that we have developed in, uh, in Europe were developed uh, in cooperation with NASA, meaning that we don't know what means that ESA not working with NASA. So it's, uh, we are working since 40 years together, but we are now uh, working with, uh, with Russia, with India, with China, with Japan, uh, with all space powers, and also, and I insist on that, with uh, all countries which have no space means, which is also an important factor, meaning that we are sharing what uh, we are doing with, uh, with the ones who have not uh, access uh, directly to, uh, to space systems. So uh, yes, it's, uh, it's an international cooperation. And, and for me, the, the essence of international cooperation is mutual understanding. I must say that uh, uh, what is lacking the most in, the, in humanity is mutual understanding. And, uh, and we have to develop a mutual understanding. Not easy, yeah. as I said many times. Cooperating is very difficult. It's always easier not to cooperate. Uh, but at least we can demonstrate that this is successful and that we can reach common objectives together. And that it's uh, certainly uh, one of the biggest lessons learned coming from uh, ESA and from our cooperation, in particular with NASA. Right. So mutual understanding being obviously a key in working towards that. And Mr. Bolden, I know that you've been involved from time being an astronaut. First shuttle mission was joint Russia, United States, uh, International Space Station, and most of the science missions are international. Uh, you've been emphasizing heavily that for us to be successful, we need to be cooperating internationally. What are some of the things that NASA would be looking to do? And, uh, how are we successful uh, when we work these international collaborations? I will try to answer your question, but I'll, I'll kind of echo something that, that Jean-Jacques said, and I will remind people that um, uh, NASA is also a collaboration of 50 independent nations. Uh, and unfortunately, we have two bodies that has 100 representatives of those 50 nations in one body, and I'll get the count wrong, but. 454 or something like that. Is that, Frank, is that close? 
435, you know, representatives of the 50 nations. So, and I don't say that in jest. Uh, if you look at where we are today, I mean, today is the 29th of uh, September, and I am sitting here agonizing over uh, the two bodies coming together on a, an authorization bill, which is the very first piece that we need for NASA to have a spending bill. Uh, and it is ongoing negotiations. And, um, you know, we're hoping that what we get is something that is very usable uh, that will allow me to continue to work with Jean-Jacques and our other international partners. But my heritage, you know, since coming out of college has been doing international relations. I, I am a 34-year veteran of the Marine Corps. And from the very beginning, um, it became imperative to me, it became very evident to me uh, how important international cooperation was. If you look at the way that we do our business around the world in peacekeeping or in disaster relief or anything, it is always an international collaboration that gets things done and gets them done effectively. So for us, as Jean-Jacques said, getting smaller nations or less capable nations uh, involved in space exploration, giving them an opportunity to do something that they would never be able to do on their own by working with ESA or JAXA or the Canadian Space Agency or Roscosmos or us, uh, I think is vital. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity to open up uh, space exploration to, to countries that otherwise would not be able to do it on their own. And part of, uh, yeah. Yes, may I say something? Because the, uh, I would like to report that it's an anecdote, but since uh, uh, we are not only uh, uh, bureaucrats, but we, we are also persons, just to say, the first time I heard about Charlie Bolden in my life. I was at ESA in charge of ISS uh, uh, utilization and I was in charge of the astronaut office, uh, meaning that I was the boss of the astronaut, uh, since I could not become myself an astronaut, so I could become their boss. Uh, but, um, <laughs> uh, uh, and our astronauts, the ESA astronauts, they were uh, training in Houston, Texas. And I remember very well that these guys, they were telling me that uh, at the beginning when they were at Houston, there was meetings among the astronauts, and the European ones, they were not invited to the meetings of the uh, ESA astronauts. And the ones who have taken them by, the, by hand and brought them to this meeting of NASA astronauts was Charlie Bolden. And I was reported that. And I must say that for me, the name of Charlie Bolden is uh, really uh, linked to that. He is the one who has taken the European astronauts and brought them to the uh, meetings of the NASA astronauts. And at least for that, this is an international-minded uh, person. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's also it's a good story in terms of you talked about mutual understanding and you know, what, what goes into that. But that was obviously an inclusive act to say, come, you know, come with us. And that, that may be part of you know, being successful internationally, inclusiveness. But behind any cooperation, there are persons. And the personal relationship is very important. Yeah. Yes, we, uh, we, uh, there is cooperation between uh, NASA and ESA, and that it's uh, since uh, 40 years. But behind that cooperation, there is a cooperation between uh, uh, Charlie Bolden and Jean-Jacques Dordain, they are cooperation between uh, Bill Gerstenmayer and uh, Simonetta Di Pippo, they are cooperation between persons. And uh, in the mutual understanding, uh, there is uh, the, the, the transparency and the mutual trust uh, between persons, and that makes the cooperation successful. If I can offer something, to be quite honest, in, um, in the US, we always, there are two terms that we use all the time in business, and they are diversity and inclusion. And, um, and most people, when, when, the name, when the term diversity is mentioned, they think of race and gender. Uh, if you talk to anybody in NASA, they will tell you that what I try to emphasize is that diversity is a, a difference of ideas, a difference of philosophies, a difference of skills, a difference of geographic background. It's just differences that make us strong. Um, what makes the, the family of spacefaring nations today so strong and what, what for me makes the International Space Station perhaps the greatest example of what you get when you get, um, when you put nations together of diverse interests and backgrounds, uh, you get an absolutely phenomenal technological achievement, never before done 
uh, by humankind, if you really stop and think about it. I remember um, my sitting with President Obama and a group of school children uh, on a day that he, he loves to do downlink TV with school kids. And, and we did it one day, and I, I think it was STS 129 or so, or 130, and it was when we, um, when we were getting ready to birth, or we had just birthed HTV to the International Space Station. And the president was, was having it described to him by the astronauts. We had had a Canadian astronaut, uh, uh, an American female uh, astronaut who was operating the Canadian arm uh, to capture a Japanese satellite and bring it into an international space station where we had 15 member nations. Uh, you know, I watched President Obama's face as they explained it to him, and he is an internationalist. But I think even he, for a moment, was flabbergasted by, um, by the achievement of a group of that diversity. The inclusiveness means that we listen to everybody's voice. Uh, no matter how small they are, everyone wants to be heard. And so I think that's what we try to do, is we try to bring everybody to the table to give them an opportunity to say, okay, we all want to explore. And we all have an idea about how to do that. So diversity and inclusiveness is a term that has become very popular in the United States, but it has to mean something to people. Right, different uh, thoughts, order. different yeah, ideas, exactly, bringing exactly. something to the yeah. table, being open yeah. to that. Uh, one of the things, obviously, uh, space is in a transitional mode. Uh, maybe historically, the first age was very much competition uh, in terms of uh, a race, and now you're talking about uh, you know, new steps to go beyond low Earth orbit and the, the importance of international cooperation. How do you see the international cooperation impacting uh, the next generation of uh, space that goes beyond low Earth orbit? And uh, you've also mentioned some of the political yeah. you know, players. How does that make things easier or harder uh, as we move ahead? You know, Jean-Jacques yesterday was mentioning the fact that competition is always good. Uh, and I agree with him. Competition is always good. I have 10 NASA centers, nine NASA centers in a, in a a federally funded research and development center, the Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, we have very friendly competition among those 10 organizations. And what they're competing for is ideas. Uh, when we talk about going to an asteroid or to a near-Earth object, uh, I have 10 different ideas about how we should approach that mission. We will come to an, an agreement at some point as to what is the best of those 10 ideas and we'll execute that. Um, will also involve our international partners. And so there should be very healthy competition of ideas. Who has the best idea for how to accomplish a particular goal? That's competition. And everybody wants their idea to be the one that this international group uh, agrees to utilize as the way we're going to do it. So I think if we ever stop competing, uh, at least for ideas, then we're dead. Yeah. Yes, abs that, uh, absolutely. I think that cooperation uh, should not prevent competition. Uh, because competition, I, this is certainly the best uh, st stimulus to, uh, to, uh, to get the, the best ideas, and, uh, and, and we need that. And as I said many times, the, uh, the, the best ideas are not uh, coming proportionally from the GNP. Uh, they can come uh, from uh, uh, small countries or uh, uh, representatives from small countries. So uh, we, we need competition. But provided this competition is organized to reach common objectives. So I think that the, the cooperation is to set the common objectives. What are we ready to, go to, uh, to do together? And, uh, and I think that uh, this is the essence of cooperation. But to reach these common objectives, I think that the competition is, uh, is very healthy. And uh, that it's uh, the, 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 first, uh, the, the first remark. The second remark is that, for me, the, the, uh, the cooperation must be as open as possible. This cannot be a closed uh, club. Uh, Let's take ESA. ESA started with six member states. We are now 18, 19 in, uh, in uh, three months from now, and, uh, and we shall grow to, to, to 25. Uh, the, the same on, uh, on human space flight. Uh, uh, 69, the US flag uh, was the only one on, on the moon. But soon after, 75, 
two flags together in orbit, USSR and USA, and then four flags with the Space Station Freedom, and five flags now with the, uh, with the International Space Station. So I think that the only way for a partnership to be, uh, to be alive and to be uh, sustainable is to stay open. And this is the reason why, in my view, uh, the, the, the vision for uh, international cooperation is to have uh, more and more cooperation between more and more actors, uh, because we have to address global issues. And, uh, and the only way to address global issues is to have a global approach. Yeah, it sounds from listening to both of you talk, it's a balance between cooperation and competition in terms of getting the best of ideas. And it sounds as if it's actually improving engineering, because uh, if you're getting the best ideas from wherever they come, then obviously you're able to improve things in a way that, uh, that you can't if you have a more limited audience. Oh, yes, we, we have to be better and better. It's what yeah. we said yesterday to the young generation because we met the students. And I told them, you have no choice but to be better than we are. Uh, because uh, space activities are more and more complex because we are going more and more uh, farer and uh, we, we, have, we are doing more and more uh, complex uh, things, meaning that uh, we have to invent the technologies meaning that the, the, the next generation must always be much better than the previous generation. And uh, our young colleagues, uh, they, they have to be better, and they are better. And, uh, and uh, this is the reason why we need the best, the best ideas and the best experts, and that will come from competition. But competition is not antagonist to, uh, to cooperation. I, I think that right. uh, provided we have common objectives. Yeah, and both of you are talking, uh, obviously, about getting better and so it makes me think about the whole notion of knowledge and lessons learned. And obviously, particular NASA, ESA, other space nations have this uh, experience now of the International <laughs> Space Station. And I think you, you've mentioned before, Mr. Dardenne, that that's uh, kind of a learning uh, area where we can start laying out governance frameworks for how do we work large, complex missions in the future. Can you maybe talk to that? What have we learned and, and how do we capture learning? I, th I think that we have learned a lot making the space station. Uh, we, we have learned, f first of all, to, uh, uh, how to work together. I must say that uh, we, we at ESA, we are working like NASA, because as I said, we have been created in cooperation with NASA. So we have the technical culture of NASA. So we have no, uh, not so many problems to, uh, to, uh, to understand in each other in terms of engineering. But the day we have worked with uh, Russia, uh, I can tell you that uh, we have learned a lot uh, from uh, working with Russia because they have developed their space activities uh, with a, a unique approach. Uh, and uh, we have learned a lot, and I think that they have learned a lot from, uh, from uh, United States and uh, uh, from, from Japan. Meaning that uh, we have to invent a common culture. Uh, not to adopt the other culture. And it's what I am saying also to my colleagues of ESA. Uh, since we are 19 nationalities, uh, we have to invent a new culture. When I was working in the United States, I was the only non-US working in uh, Rocket Dime, so I had no choice but to adopt the US culture because I could not uh, mix uh, one guy, one French, uh, to uh, a bunch of uh, US engineers. So. That there, I, I had to adopt the, the U.S. culture. While when you are working together, you have to invent a new culture, which is uh, taking the best of what each partner can, uh, can bring. So that, this is the best lessons learned. And the second lessons learned is the solidarity. We have crossed a lot of difficulties to develop the space station. We have crossed even catastrophe. Uh, together, and uh, unfortunately, the accident, uh, the Columbia accident, as I have expressed myself, was not a NASA catastrophe. It was a catastrophe of the partners, and uh, we are. Uh, I felt really uh, uh, to, to be part of, of that. But the solidarity has worked, and uh, we could uh, uh, succeed in completing the space station by, uh, by that uh, solidarity. Now, there are also lessons learned for the future, and as I said many times, uh, what I wish is to take the lessons learned of having uh, not had, uh, having uh, uh, a common transportation policy for the ISS. We have all taken unilateral decisions on transportation. 
and I am not sure that the, the, the result of that uh, is uh, the most fantastic uh, result that we, uh, we can have because uh, we have some duplications and we have some gaps in our transportation system to ISS. Uh, so we, have, we, we can do better and we shall do better. So uh, we, we can share uh, the lessons learned and, and all the partners, they have spent a lot of time to, uh, to develop the lessons learned from the space station. And I can tell you that it's a book like that, uh, a lot of page and a lot of recommendations, meaning that we can improve the partnership and we shall improve the partnership. Right. There's many, uh, many areas, obviously, you, you cover in terms of learning lessons. And I wanted to ask Mr. Bolden, what are the things that you feel NASA needs to do, uh, not only as the administrator, but you've been an astronaut, you've been a part of these missions. How do we uh, build a ability to learn from working together on space station, on, on shuttle, on you know, the big scientific missions, uh, in line of the fact that everyone's always looking towards the next mission. You know, how do we learn uh, towards uh, what's happened in the past? Well, I think we, um, we learn two ways. We, we look at our experiences. We always talk about learning lessons in blood. Uh, but we also bring in fresh blood. We, um, one of the reasons that, that Jean-Jacques and I love to talk with uh, young groups like are here at this Congress or at the Space Generation Congress that, that met before, before we began is because um, they have an energy that we don't have. You know, I like to think I'm a, I am a young, energetic person, but when I hang around some of these 20, 30-year-olds, uh, let me tell you, they put you to shame, and they have new fresh ideas um, because they have looked at the way that we have done things and they've said, you know, that, that will never work. Or, yeah, it works, but it can be better. And so I think we learn by, by observing the mistakes that my generation has made and trying to learn from them. But we also learn when we, again, become more inclusive in our planning and we bring in young, fresh ideas from some of the people who are represented here and who will ask some of the questions that we hear. For NASA, that's very difficult. Um, you know, I am, uh, I, I tell people all the time, I, I, am, I am incredibly proud to be the administrator of NASA, but, um, but I'm probably the most behind person in the whole agency, one, because of my age and because of my own personal experiences. You know, um, I am a person who came from 1960s and 70s technology vehicles uh, traveling into space. Uh, the people who work for me today, the young astronauts, um, they fly, you know, 21st century vehicles um, that I never even saw. And they have a hard time getting into a space shuttle, for example, that I brag has a glass cockpit. Well, yeah, it is a glass cockpit, but that's only in form, you know, the, it's glass. Right. But, but the glass cockpit that uses uh, open architecture and these kinds of things is not there. Uh, because that's just the way we designed it. Newer vehicles are going to have, have to be different, and they will help us get there. Um, utilization of commercial entities for travel to space. That's foreign to us, uh, doing it the way that we're going to have to do it. Um, we are always involved with commercial entities because everything we buy comes from a commercial entity. But it's how we operate that that's going to be dramatically different in terms of how we access low Earth orbit. And that's it's causing us a lot of angst right now, to be quite honest. Yeah, right. yeah. there's a lot of issues that, that they, you've raised. Uh, one of the things that um, I know I'm going to get questions uh, from, the, uh, from the audience we have here uh, in Prague. And so uh, uh, when you're ready, I guess, come up and, uh, and give them to me. Uh, but I'll use this as an opportunity for another thing. Um, you've talked about a lot of issues, both of you. What do you see as some of the key shared challenges things that you really need to be able to address together. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. there's a lot of technical things like orbital debris, and there's also the social things of maybe creating a new culture of being effective. Uh, what's, uh, you know, what's on your minds as leaders of these organizations in space that, that are really the things cooperatively we need to, to address? What are the key shared challenges? Well, I, hate to, I hate to bother everybody with mundane things, but the number one challenge, I think, for all of us, nobody, you know, I've had several meetings this morning, as has Jean-Jacques, and in every meeting, economics comes up, uh, budgets. And, and funding for space exploration is an issue for all of us. Um, people say, but how do you, why is that a problem? And it's because 
the number of people who really grasp the importance of exploration uh, you know, is relatively small. I think everybody says they understand. But when it comes to, okay, I'm going to go into my wallet and I'm going to put money on this, uh, people find all kinds of competing interests. So, so finances is, is a common interest of, of every space agency that I know. Um, integrating new technologies is an issue because that, that costs something to do that. It, it doesn't come for free. And, uh, and transitioning the, the workforce uh, from old technology to new technology. Those are things that I think we all, we all face. Right. So budget, getting the money, yeah. uh, new technologies, integrating it, and uh, the workforce, which obviously gets everything done. Yeah. Um, it, it makes me think about what comes first. Do you know how much money you have and then you build off of that, or do you have a strategy and then you get the, the money? Maybe you can, can think about that. But um, Mr. Dan, what are your thoughts in terms of the shared challenges? Well, I think that I share those challenges which are mentioned by, by Charlie. I think that, uh, as I said yesterday, we have already a big challenge, which is to make our mission successful. Right. I can tell you that uh, each launch, uh, each uh, new spacecraft is for me, uh, I am never cool when I have a launch or when I have a, a new spacecraft going to orbit because we are uh, uh, working with advanced technologies and there are always technical risks. So, uh, uh, our duty is first to, uh, to have uh, missions uh, successful. The, and, the, and, and the second challenge is, uh, again, what I said yesterday, it's to, uh, to develop a mutual understanding be the, uh, with, between the, the space world and the world of citizens. I think that we have a lot to do there uh, because uh, I think that there is not yet an awareness in the, in the society and therefore in the, in the political uh, governments, which are just the essence of uh, the citizens, on, on the importance of space for the future of planet Earth. I think that uh, uh, we, we have a lot of challenge ahead of us, uh, be it env for environment, for security, uh, for, uh, for energy, and that space is not the unique answer, but space is part of that future. And uh, we have to develop that uh, understanding and uh, connecting the space world and the real world is, uh, is a challenge for me because uh, we are a world of engineers, a world of scientists. Mm -hmm. Not easy to make uh, the uh, citizens understanding that we are not doing that only for pleasure, but also to make their future possible. Right, which even it broadens the collaboration to people who communicate and share and uh, you know spread the story about the importance of space. Um, I have questions uh, from the audience. I'm going to ask those, but I have to ask uh, uh, one of a question: Does working international missions make it easier, uh, or does it make it harder when you're trying to establish some of the directions that we want to go Ooh. in terms of space? I will give you, um, I, I talk about three things. Um, programs have to be affordable. Uh, you know, you have to be able to live within a budget. Uh, they have to be sustainable, which means they have to last in the United States over multiple administrations and multiple Congresses. And I always give the International Space Station as my best example. The International Space Station is sustainable and has lasted as long as it has because it is an international collaboration and it is very difficult for the United States or any other nation to turn and walk away from it because it's the result of a treaty. Right. And um, so for me, anything I can make international means that I, it stands a chance, it's, it, whether it's remote, but it stands a chance of being sustainable. In, our, in my system of government, um, when it is just US or just American, it changes every four years, or, or sometimes every two years. So, um, you know, I, I think critical. It is critical that we do as much as we can in an international, uh, from an international perspective. Right. No, I, I think that uh, again, for me, international cooperation, and this is the daily lessons learned from ISA. They are they are harder and they are slower to put in place. That uh, it's very clear. But when they are put in place. They are much more solid uh, because to get out from a partnership, it's uh, much more difficult. And, uh, and they are more successful 
because we are putting more expertise and, uh, uh, in that uh, development. So, uh, yes, harder and slower yeah. to put in place, but after that, uh, more solid and certainly more successful. So, to so work on international missions, since you have a better chance of having them happen. Uh, let me ask uh, some of the questions from our audience uh, here in Prague at the International Astronautical Congress. Um, here's a question for both of you. For young professionals, who are sometimes not so young, it's sometimes frustrating to deal with the huge public service machine, in quotes. In your view, what are the best skills or skills that you've developed that help you to deal with this maze and to keep your sanity. So I guess in an environment of uh, uh, so much administrative, maybe oversight, bureaucracy, uh, different stakeholders, uh, what are the skills necessary to be successful and become leaders of uh, ESA and NASA and keep your sanity? I, I, I think one of, one of the best skills is, um, is a skill communication. Um, you have to be able to tell people what it is that, that you want to do. You have to be able to express um, adequately to people of diverse cultures and diverse interests uh, what it is that you want to do. The other skill, and, it, and it, I think it is a skill, it's a gift, but it's a skill, and, and it's, um, it is the ability to, to try to remain calm in the face of adversity. You could pull your hair out. Uh, any of us could on any given day. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> As you look at both of us, you're going, but, but um, um, there is a very, there is a need to try to remain calm uh, in the face of everything that's going on around you because otherwise you just, you know, you'll get nothing done at all. Right. Yeah. And that's how you help keep your sanity with the communications yeah. and the openness and any thoughts on keeping sanity? No, I would. Okay, I don't know if I have uh, kept sanity, but uh, but I am trying. Uh, okay, I, I'm, uh, I share what Charlie was saying. I would add maybe uh, I fully share the fact that uh, we have to stay calm and uh, uh, to be patient also, because uh, yeah. I am the first one to be frustrated by uh, the 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 slowness of, uh, of public investment. This is true that uh, private investment uh, is uh, much quicker and, uh, and that public investment is always mo mo slower. And uh, you have to be patient. Uh, and, but you have to be determined uh, because you, uh, you should not give up so quickly. And this is the reason why you have to be persistent. So it's uh, patient. Uh, cool and persistent. And uh, uh, the, uh, the second thing which is very important is not to try to solve technical problems by political solutions. Uh, I think that uh, this is very important to leave to the engineers the technical problems and the technical solutions. And that is yeah. very, very important. And I think in every case, um, you know, I always ask people, bring me the right answer. Bring me the correct technical answer, the correct technical solution to the problems that, that face us, and then let me worry about the politics. Uh, please don't consider uh, political implications of what it is we're working on because we're gonna come up with the wrong answer. Right. Uh, a politically expedient answer is never the right answer for an organization that deals with life and death and, um, and the, the, basically the survival of the species, to be quite, and I know I'm being very dramatic here, but, but that's what we do. Um, if you're talking about dealing with neos, um, I mean, they can hurt the planet, <laughs> you know, and if we try to ignore the fact that they exist because it's not politically expedient to think about them, uh, one of these days we could become like the dinosaurs. And I don't want to be the NASA administrator when that happens. So I, I, want, I want people in NASA and our partner agencies to bring us the correct technical solution to problems and let us go into the political arena and try to figure out how we're either going to be able to do that or we're going to make a compromise. And compromise is all, that, that again, I think compromise is a skill. Um, not everybody has the, the skill to compromise. Most. Many people today, at least in my country, feel that compromise is, uh, is a weakness. Uh, that if you are willing to compromise, then you are not going to win uh, 
if you are not willing to compromise in my mind, you will never win. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's uh, the skills of you have to, first of all, love what you do. Oh, we're passionate. Yeah. And uh, then also the ability to, to obviously yeah. work with others. And, and uh, you, you emphasize we need to make decisions based on sound engineering, right. maybe sound science. Yeah. And uh, don't worry so much about the, the politics. That'll take care of it. You've got to keep working that, but, but keep no, we, moving we, forward. We have to take care of the politics. Right. We, we are receiving money from governments and uh, taxpayers. So uh, right. obviously, uh, uh, I am not ignoring politics. Uh, it's a significant part of my job. But uh, what, what I was saying is that there are some technical problems uh, that we have to solve because uh, we, have techni we, we are making a technically difficult job. Uh, what we are doing is difficult, and, uh, uh, and mixing political uh, motivations and technical problems that can start to be uh, to uh, to be to the detriment of uh, of our success. And and this is where we have to. And this is, I think, that the role of the uh, of the administrator or the director general is to to sort out the technical problems and the political problems. The two are there, but not mixing. Um, here's another question, and uh, it starts by saying, all big organizations have lots of bureaucracy, but that may be a thing of the past if you leverage the new communication technologies. How do you feel about using the new technologies that young people are using, uh, but that people high in the hierarchy may not be using? So there's a lot of social technologies, I guess Facebook and Twitter and... Uh, whole bunch of uh, these kinds of things. How do you feel that helps uh, in terms of working together? That, uh, I must say, I am, this is certainly uh, my age, but uh, I don't think that the bureaucracy is uh, coming from a lack of technology. The bureaucracy, and it's always what I say to my colleagues of ESA, a significant part of the bureaucracy is coming from a lack of trust among each other. And I can tell you that I see that on my uh, desk every night. I have a bunch of uh, papers to sign, and uh, more than 50% of these papers are written because of a lack of trust among people. And uh, there is always a lot of signatures because uh, there is a lack of trust. And uh, I, was, I am saying to my colleagues, I am the first victim of the bureaucracy uh, at ESA. Uh, but the best way to, uh, to lighten the bureaucracy is to trust your neighbor. Because myself, when I trust someone, I don't, uh, I don't have to write a memo and to sign a memo. I, uh, I just call him or I see him. And frankly speaking, I prefer to see my colleagues than to even to call them or to write an email. Uh, but when I trust someone, I don't, want to, I, I don't need to write a memo or to have uh, uh, a written agreement with that. Uh, and, and this is a problem. Yes, we have a bureaucracy. Obviously, we cannot suppress the bureaucracy when you are working with 18 government. Uh, I must say that uh, you have to accept, uh, you have to accept uh, the bureaucracy. But again, a significant part of the bureaucracy is coming from a lack of trust, either among member states or among uh, colleagues uh, inside ESA. And that, it's a big problem, because you cannot buy trust. You have just to build up trust, and uh, that takes time. Right. So collaboration through trust, and the technologies can help you, but they're not going to replace something that's not there, it sounds like. No, I yeah. can tell you that we recently introduced a new uh, fantastic informatic tool uh, at ESA, and I have not measured the difference in terms of bureaucracy. <laughs> okay. Mr. Volta? I, I echo everything Jean-Jacques has said. <laughs> okay. So build on, on the people relationships and seeing and meeting and uh, building up the trust. Uh, another question is, how do you see the possibility to have emerging space nations send astronauts and or experiments to the International Space Station in order to advance their space programs. And what challenges do you see related to that? So uh, emerging nations um, getting involved in experiments and astronauts uh, on the uh, ISS challenges and opportunities. One of the things we talked about uh, here as well as when we were in Tokyo with our heads of agency last year was um, how do we bring other nations into the, into the involvement in the International Space Station? And we, 
we use two terms. We use partners and participants. And, and I think some people heard me yesterday say that the partnership is pretty set, and it, it was established by treaty, and it's a very, very complex interaction of nations that reach these agreements. And when you mess with it, uh, you put the whole partnership in jeopardy. So I like, to, I like the agreement that we all reached last year, which was encouraging each member agency to seek partners with whom they can work uh, to, to collaborate on experiments or projects and bring them on board the International Space Station as a collaborator or a new participant. Um, and I think that way we will be able to integrate many, many more nations who otherwise would never do it on their own. Right. The other thing I'll say that I, and, and I, I need to, I really want to emphasize this. Um, I think we, we talk about the International Space Station as if it is the ultimate destination and it is the end of the world. The International Space Station is the beginning. Uh, if we want, we always talk about commercial space. Uh, if the only destination is the International Space Station, then there will never be a successful commercial space industry. There has to be multiple destinations, and, and many of those destinations are in what we call the, the uh, I think we call it, what path, variable path or mini path or whatever, but it's, it, it's going to different destinations beyond low Earth orbit. But in low Earth orbit, there, meet, there need to be multiple destinations to which commercial entities can go. Otherwise, we can't build a, viable, a real viable uh, industry. So I really encourage um, universities, businesses, everybody to uh, create other destinations other than the International Space Station. Right. So there are opportunities, and we have to be aware of we need to keep going you know, more and more towards the future. There are so. endless opportunities if we allow ourselves to right. think of them. And that's why I say young people, uh, and it, it, young is a relative term, but, uh, but some of the people who are here at this Congress, um, I will not be surprised to see some of them within the year uh, start their own business and they're gonna collaborate with somebody who is going to create a single module that will orbit Earth in equatorial orbit and someone will want to go there to do something. And that right. will be the real beginning of the commercial space industry, not the International Space Station. Okay. Okay, now just to echo what uh, Charlie uh, was saying, I think that, uh, and I have said that, uh, I think that uh, anyway, the cooperation, uh, we should not put a limit to the, to, to the number of uh, participants. I think that uh, everybody is welcome. And, and by the way, we are already starting that on board the ISS. Uh, we, uh, we ESA, and we have asked the partners to accept that uh, what we plan is to open at least for a, a transition period uh, the, uh, the space station to the uh, EU member states which are not member of ESA, just to, uh, to start and uh, associate uh, more participants and the partners they have accepted. So, so all that should be, should be uh, it's our interest to have uh, uh, that as open as possible, but obviously this should not be to the detriment of the current partnership that this is very important and to the detriment of those who have invested to, uh, to develop the space station. So, uh, so provided we respect these two conditions for the rest, I think that uh, we, uh, we should welcome more and more participants on board the space right. station and to any other uh, joint venture we can, uh, we can have together. Right. It sounds like there's ways not only for being involved in uh, uh, current space programs, but helping nations uh, that are emerging in terms of benefiting from the applications of space. Uh, one of the questions here, and I know we're coming down towards, uh, towards our timeline, um, are there any plans to collaborate in projects related to the detection and deflection of potentially hazardous asteroids? So uh, as a way of protecting uh, planet Earth from what might have killed off the dinosaurs, I guess, are there any plans that ESA and NASA have for uh, uh, detecting and deflecting those? We have all talked about it individually, and I think you will find that there will be more collaboration uh, in America's national space policy uh, that, that we unveiled this summer. Uh, planetary protection in, in the form of defense against near-Earth objects and the like has become very important. 
Uh, and the only, again, I think the only way we're going to effectively do that is through international collaboration and, and partnership. Um, you have all, many of you have heard um, Russ Cosmos, Mr. Permanoff, talk about it quite a bit. Uh, I know Jean Jacques talks about it. Uh, you don't hear me talk about it a lot because I have people like Tom Jones and Rusty Schweigert who, uh, who do all the talking about it for me. But, uh, but it is something that's very important and it, and it will be a challenge that we will tackle uh, through our international partnerships. No, it's part, it's part of, the, uh, of the future of planet Earth. So speaking of dinosaurs, I think that the asteroids uh, are uh, certainly important uh, for us not to become di the dinosaurs. And, uh, and certainly the near-Earth the near objects are uh, part of the threats uh, for the future of planet Earth. And we are working on that, uh, part of the space situation awareness uh, that uh, we have started. The, the near-Earth near objects are part of these uh, uh, activities. And, uh, I fully agree with Charlie. I think that this is a global, uh, a global challenge. Uh, this is the let's say, United States or Europe will not uh, save uh, individually from a problem of asteroids. So I think that uh, we have to uh, to work all together for that. Right. Uh, final couple of questions that I have to ask. Uh, you know, there's a lot of young professionals here. A lot of people who are starting their careers in space. What sparked both of your interests to get involved in engineering and launch and, and working at uh, the space business? And uh, same thing for, for both of you. What, what, what got it excited? What, what got you wanting to be in the space business? What I wanted to be when I have started? Oh, I must say, I have no, never asked myself the question, what, what should I like to do? I must say that, uh, as I said many times, and this is true, you can check, I have entered the secondary school at 10 years old on the 1st of October, 57. And to celebrate my entry into the secondary school, uh, USSR has launched uh, the uh, Sputnik just a couple of days later. <laughs> and, uh, and I have got my engineering degree on the 20th of July, 69. And to celebrate that, United States have put Neil, Neil Armstrong on the moon, uh, meaning that uh, I am bound by the space events. And uh, when I was a student, I was spending my nights uh, uh, with some of my uh, friends uh, to listen to the Apollo projects and so on, because they were always doing that during the night in Europe. So it's, uh, uh, but we enjoyed that very much. And so I was, uh, I am in space since uh, October 57, and I am still there, and I have no intention to quit, as you know. So it's, uh, uh, but for me, so for me, it's a natural, uh, it's a natural thing, and uh, I am an engineer, and I have started to work on uh, propulsion because I think that uh, this is the basics of space. Access to space is the, the starting point, and uh, I must say that mastering fire when you are working on propulsion is something great. Uh, the only thing that uh, I have not done is flying in space. I have been selected to be an astronaut, but I never flew, and uh, unfortunately, the chances are decreasing by every year. But okay, uh, <laughs> still ready. <laughs> And, in my uh, case, and I won't, I won't bore everybody with my story, I'm one who never dreamed of flying in space, never dreamed of flying an airplane. Uh, in fact, came out of high school in Columbia, South Carolina, um, going to the United States Naval Academy because I wanted to wear the uniform. Uh, and it looked good, and girls came around. Uh, so mine was a very immature, naive reason for going where I went, but that was the beginning for me. I, I, through subsequent steps, uh, I found myself in flight school, uh, something I said I would never do. Fell in love with flying the very first time I got in an airplane. And I, and I tell you, one of the things about my job is, and, and, and most people who fly airplanes or, or work around the space program, we are privileged to do something that, for which we would pay. Uh, you know, if we thought we could get away with it, we would pay to be allowed to do the work we do. But you got to eat. So, but, but I, I have been that way all my life. I have enjoyed uh, something that other people would kill to do. Um, I ended up in the space program almost on a dare from a hero of mine, the late great Dr. Ron McNair, who was uh, one of the members of the class of 1978, the first space shuttle astronaut selected. And uh, we had grown up not very far from each other, did not know each other. He asked me if I was gonna apply for the space program as a test pilot. I said, not on your life. And he said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Why not? And I said, I wouldn't get picked. He said, you know, how do you know? 
<laughs> and so I responded to the challenge and I applied and I was fortunate enough to get selected. So, so I, I've been blessed in my life in, in doing different things. I, I, didn't, you know, I didn't plan this. It just, uh, God worked well for me. Yeah. For me, it was not even a plan. It was natural. Yes. I must say, I never asked the question. I never asked myself the question. I think that uh, this was just a natural thing. I'm getting uh, our, our folks to indicate I'm down to a couple of minutes, and so I need to get down to our final question. It's gone very fast, this, this, this discussion. Um, again, young professionals and uh, the students, both of you emphasize heavily that uh, it's about getting people ready for stepping up. and. Uh, what advice do you give to young people who want to get into space? And uh, you know, what do our organizations do to, uh, to help make that happen? Mine and, is a uh, really weird answer. I tell people, forget it. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, it, it and, and when I say young people, when I talk to a high school or a college student, I really do. I say, forget it. Focus on learning and getting everything you can in your brain do what you do incredibly well, and then once you feel like you're the best at your job, then apply for the space program or do whatever. So I, I take a different tack than most people. Yeah. Okay, so learning, uh, just enjoy what you're doing. I tell them to do be the, the best that they can learn, do and be then the best. tell everybody they See want to See where it space. goes, yeah. No, I, I, I agree, and I think that, uh, again, in space, we need, we need the best. And uh, I think that uh, those who want to, to, uh, to work uh, in space, they, they must be the best, because uh, the challenge ahead are even much more difficult than the challenge that we have taken ourselves. So uh, that is certainly uh, uh, the, the, the first advice. And the second one is to take pleasure. I think that you, you, you cannot work in that uh, domain if you are not taking pleasure. It's difficult. I have difficult times being a director general of visa, but I take pleasure, and that this is maybe the only way to uh, to keep sanity, as you said uh, before. Uh, and number three, think and act global. I think that you working in space, you have to work uh, on global issues and at a global scale. I think that uh, this is not anymore something for U.S., for Europe, for Russia, for China. This is something for everyone and I think that uh, everything and, and what we are doing here at, I, at IEF uh, putting the students from a lot of different nationalities already now uh, talking to each other working and thinking uh, together I think that this is certainly the best thing that we can do Charlie uh, our colleagues and myself to, to make sure that uh, the young generation will think and act globally. Okay. So be global, be competent, and love what you do. And uh, then you may grow up to be NASA administrator or the ESA director uh, and, uh, and, and, and enjoy it all. Uh, anyway, I've been uh, having a wonderful time uh, in this discussion. It's been very pleasurable for me. I hope you've all enjoyed having uh, Jean-Jacques Dordain and Charlie Bolden with us. And so let's thank them. And. Uh, Appreciate it, and we'll let you get on to your next meetings. Thank you very much. <laughs>